Good morning. It's so great to be here with you this morning. Just continue with our names of Jesus. Again, my name is Kendall Knight. I'm one of the evangelists here. And it's an honor to be able to share with you this morning. But before we get started, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus laying it all down for us. God, it's amazing that you sent your son, your one and only son, Father, to mediate for us, to stand in the gap, to stand in the middle, Father, to solve a dispute of sinful creatures like ourselves that needed to be reconciled to you. Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit leads us through this service today for the rest of the service as you speak through me and the others that are participating. We thank you, God, and we honor you, and we're so grateful for today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's message is Jesus the Mediator. Again, thank you for, for being here this morning. Uh, welcome to the North River Church of Christ. It's a special month for us. It's our 15th anniversary as a congregation together. And I can tell you personally, it's been just a wonderful experience for us. We're so grateful, Diane and I, my family, that we had a chance to come to North River uh, just to rekindle some old relationships, to get rebooted ourselves spiritually, and also build new relationships. It's been a wonderful time for us, and we're so grateful. Being led by our senior leadership, the Christ-like devotion that they have to the scriptures and to Jesus has been amazing. But today we're gonna talk about Jesus the mediator. Personally, I'm super excited about this topic. Uh, as I was looking at this topic, it just really dawned on me how far God was willing to go to save us. As we look over here in the verse, it's really interesting. Uh, it looks in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 is sort of our starting verse. And the apostle Paul is sharing, he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. So when you look at a mediator, here's the thing we see. Let's define a mediator. A mediator is one who mediates, that is one who acts as an intermediary to work with opposing sides in order to bring about a settlement. A mediator attempts to influence a disagreement between two parties with the goal of resolving a dispute. So we probably wonder, well, what is a dispute that we have that Jesus needed to come for us? Well, you look here, it's sin that puts us in dispute with God. Romans 6, 30, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 34 says, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You know, when you look at this passage, it's just amazing, as I said. You know, of course, Jesus is the uh, mediator of a new covenant, as Hebrews talks about. But it's the writer that I'm inspired by, and that's the Apostle Paul. As we know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. But we all know his history. In Acts chapter 9, he was on his way, on his road to, uh, uh, to destroy more Christians and kill God's people. In fact, what's interesting about it is Jesus appears to him and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then, of course, Ananias is the one who's supposed to help him with his conversion. And Ananias is afraid. He's like, don't you know, God, this is the one breathing mur- murderous threats on your people? And what's interesting about this, God says to him, this is my chosen instrument. My chosen instrument. I was convicted by that because if you look at the environment we're in and we look at the situation between COVID-19 and of course we prayed about the racial unjust and some of the tremendous heroes that have stood up for that, you know, of course, uh, John Lewis and and C.T. Vivian and the like, and you think about the nonviolence approach these men had, but also you look at Jesus' approach to us how he's maniacal in saving us in spite of who we are. That Jesus has a tremendous vision for us and wants to mediate for us and is willing to go all lengths to save our souls. Just a very powerful concept when you look at this verse. What does Jesus do for us? The first thing I want to share with with us is Jesus mediates through his blood. There's this wonderful discussion the writers in Hebrews going through right here is that he's trying to help the Hebraic Jews, these Christians, not to go back to their previous life. And it'd be interesting to know who that writer is. I mean, candidly, I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know because early on in the passage in Hebrews 9, it's talking about the tabernacle and things that were slaughtered and, you know, going back and forth and the blood, the priests and how they were represented and all these different things. 
And then it brings up in Hebrews 9, it talks about later on in the passage, he says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he's died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So we look here very closely. Jesus was sent as an unblemished man to help those who are blemished, which is you and I. And we look at that blood, that blood of the covenant, that blood that was shed. And we know the story about Cain and Abel, and we know that Abel's blood was shed out of vengeance. But Jesus' blood was shed out of grace and mercy and love and compassion and eternal inheritance. That's why his blood was shed. He was a ransom to set us free from the sins committed under the first covenant. The brothers and sisters in the Old Testament had to wait for us, had to wait for Jesus to, re- to, to come in order to share this new covenant with us. It's a powerful passage. And because of this, because of being set free by his blood, we get to walk in the light. We get to walk in the light. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we lie and we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This passage in 1 John is incredibly powerful. Okay, so Jesus came, right, to free us with his blood. He shed his blood on the cross. We all know that fundamental principle. We all know that that's why he came. He came as a sacrifice for us to free the world. But then in 1 John, John is telling us, well, wait a minute. If we walk in the light as he himself in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, wait a minute. Aren't we Christians? Aren't we supposed to be sinless? No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying in this journey is that we're going to continue to struggle with sin. We're going to continue to struggle with issues that we struggled with previously. We're going to struggle with the things that we were converted with or converted out of as Christians. And I think sometimes we have this false sense of security like, wait a minute, if I sin, I'm guilty. Well, we're all guilty as charged, right? We're all guilty sinners. We all are. We all are. But I think to have this idea that we won't fall or don't fall is is just false sense of security right there. Because you look at this, he's saying, wait a minute, he's faithful. He's faithful to us and righteous to continue to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's not talking to a lost world. He's talking to Christians, disciples of Jesus Christ. That's who he's talking to. He's not talking, hey, I want to convert you. You didn't study the Bible. Let's do the Word, study anything. Let's do discipleship, amen. No, he's talking to Christians that were converted, that got baptized, repented, and still need cleansing. We go through this wonderful spiritual shower every day. It's wonderful. We smell good in front of God. As long as we're living a life filled with repentance, it's not one save, always save, he's saying here. What he's saying is, is like, if you're not, don't be a Pharisee. Don't lie, you're going to sin. Confess your sin. Talk about your sin. Let me tell you something. I remember as a young Christian, and I'm so grateful for this brother today, my roommate back in Brooklyn, New York, this brother named uh, Dimitri Brown. Some of the brothers who uh, are on, on live stream know who I'm talking about. Love Dimitri, great brother. I owe him a lot today. Even still today, I owe him a lot. I was really struggling as a young Christian. I mean, I was sort of upside down in regard to my lifestyle. Give you an example. When I was a a young Christian, my night on Thursday through Sunday would start at 11 p.m. So here's how it would look, okay? So basically, what I did is I worked my full-time job, nine to five. Then at 11 o'clock, it was on, okay? Then we're at the nightclub. In fact, it was so bad, I have a plaque on the wall today called the Savage Crew. I was one of the Hall of Famers. I mean, I was just an absolute club head. I mean, it was terrible. So with that, 
it was really difficult for me to, on a Saturday night, now this may say sound strange to some, but to me, this really was my life, is that it was difficult for me to just, okay, what time we have to be home with the sisters um, on a Saturday night day? What, what time on Friday, 11 o'clock? Oh man, I'm just getting started. You know what I mean? It's kind of like my clock was just all messed up. And it seemed like I was addicted to this stuff. And there was such a strong addiction to partying and being out late and coming home at four in the morning, going to sleep and doing that all over again and doing that all over again. And I really had to pray and get help. Well, it got to the point where I wanted to indulge in the full lifestyle again. It got that bad. And so the brother kind of tracked my whereabouts. He understood what was going on. He understood that there was some struggles. He knew my background. He knew my lifestyle. He was in in there with me on a regular basis. And so one day he calls me up and I was really struggling. Purity, I mean, everything. I was starting to get very carnal and very worldly again. And I remember specifically him saying, hey, bro, how you doing? You know, because I started feeling guilty. As a young Christian, I didn't understand God's Jesus' blood. I didn't understand grace. So he's like, hey, bro, how you doing? What's going on? That's all he had to say to me. He said, uh, what's happening? Are you struggling again with um, the same issues? I said, yeah, man, I, I really am. I- I'm having a hard time right now, and uh, I really want you to, to help me uh, get back on my feet. Well, let me tell you something. 25 years later as a Christian, guess what? I still have to have those conversations. I still have to have them because as a Christian, I need to understand that I'm fallible and I'm flawed. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that reconciles me. And I think that as Christians, it's important for us to remain transparent so that the blood of Jesus continues to shed its power on us. God wants to forgive us. We can walk in the light as he is in the light. If we sin, I'm not saying it's okay, I'm not condoning it, but I am saying be transparent, be honest, be cordial with one another, be gracious with one another. Make sure those conversations are full of grace, season with salt, save your rebukes for other times, talk with one another, reconcile people to Jesus, don't be the condemner, Let, leave that in God's hand, be the one that loves people deeply. And I really believe that we will feel the light and we'll feel the power of God. And as a result of that conversation, I'm still here today preaching God's word. I couldn't imagine that without having that spiritual support if it wasn't for that brother in my life. Second thing, Jesus mediates through prayer. You know, I always looked at John 17, 20 through 23, and I never really looked a lot at this passage until I did this study. And it's a really amazing passage. It's right before Jesus' prayer on unity, which is one of my favorite prayers in all of the Bible. But I noticed that the, the writer in John and some of the scholars, when they, when they put this passage together, you all know that The Bible doesn't have book chapters and verses, you know, in in the original text, right? It doesn't have verse one and verse two. That's not the case. But the scholars were able to disseminate the differences of who Jesus was talking to. And what's interesting about this passage, as opposed to John 17, verse 20, it says Jesus prays for all believers in the NIV. That's sort of where I looked at in, in the Holman translation. But it says here in John 17, Verse 15, it says that Jesus prays for his disciples in John 17, verse 15. This is another way that Jesus mediates for us. In John 17, verse 15, it says, I'm not praying that you, may, they, you, that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so they also may be sanctified by the truth. This is really amazing, okay? Because when you look at this passage, Jesus is praying, don't take them out of the world, God. Don't take them out of the world. Don't do that. I need you to protect them from the evil one. Protect them from Satan. But also, here's something else he says. They are not of the world as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Sanctify, there's one of those powerful words again. What does it mean? God, set them apart. Make them holy in this tough world. Make sure that they they are connected to the truth, the word of God. Make sure the word of God, God, keeps them separate. Let that mediate their hearts. Let that help them. Let them stay connected. God, please, don't take them out. 
I've sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them. So they also may be sanctified by the truth. The truth that Jesus died. The truth that he shed his blood for us on the cross. The truth that we get to be the light of the world and have fellowship with one another as we continue to confess and be open and let the blood of Jesus uh, shower us. God, please continue to take care of your people. Set them apart in this world. As challenging as this world is right now, we are supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be set apart. They are not of the world as I'm not of the world. We are literally, this is not our home. You hear that? This is not our home. This world is not our home. That's why we need a mediator. That's why we need a go-between. Messiah, the Greek word. Jesus stood in the center. He was going to resolve the dispute between us and God by using his son. Not only that, his son was going to pray for us to continue to mediate for us. Powerful passage. Powerful concept amazing stuff. I got a long sleeve shirt on, the hair in my arms is standing up. As a football coach, that's not hard to do. Okay, amen. Hair in my arms, it's an exciting point. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That prayer right there tells us we can overcome Satan. How do we overcome Satan? Through humility is how we overcome Satan. Transparency, honesty, candidness, The Holy Spirit helps us to overcome the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, as the Bible says in James. You know, I appreciate, one of the things I've learned a lot coming to North River is how much the brothers pray. Now, you may say, well, wow, okay. um, That seems like a novel thought. Seems like a very um, simple thought. Well, for me, oh, pray, okay, great. And I've really admired from a distance Now I have multiple prayer partners several times a week, three to five brothers I pray with almost every morning, praying all the time about different things, their different lives, different days, all the time. And I learned that from Tom. Tom Brown, you know, I'm quote unquote a tent maker evangelist. I used to get paid by the church years ago. And um, now I work in the business world and I'm grateful for that, amen. Praise God for that. But the thing that's interesting about it, Tom would come up and say, hey bro, and he's persistent, he keeps asking me, hey man, hey listen, um, look, I prayed for that first set of people for you, for your pipeline, for this. I need some more names. I, I need some more names, man. I, I need some more names. I need more people to pray for. You know, the fact that he prays through all these lists, prays through the, the fellowship, the body, and how he's willing to mediate in prayer for us is really spectacular. I mean, it's really amazing. I think that prayer is what does it. Prayer moves God's heart. Prayer does change things. And, you know, the things he's prayed about, of course, you know, they've come through. Some really challenging business dynamics have come through. Both of them have. I'm not saying that's exclusively because of that, but I also think, you know, it has a lot to do with that. But in other areas, I pray. I I think I've I've been really, really stronger in my purity since I've been here because I've prayed a lot more about it. I mean, I've been very much more stronger about fighting pride and being more humble and being more transparent and really uh, uh, merging more spiritual relationships. I've prayed a lot about that. I'm learning through prayer that prayer makes a difference. And I think that this is what Jesus wants us to do. We are not of this world, brothers and sisters, and that's not easy for me to say because I'm such a worldly guy by nature, but we're not. And I think we've got to spend more time praying for one another, prayerless, engaging in prayer, because that's what Jesus would do. Jesus mediates through prayer. Here's something that's powerful as well. Jesus mediates through us. He mediates through us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And look, new things have come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. This is the Holman translation. And he's committed the message of reconciliation to us. I capitalized that for a reason. Us, that's not U.S., That's not U.S., that's us, us, U.S., us, okay? Therefore, we are what? Ambassadors for Christ. Certain that God is appealing through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
man, this, this, this right here is, is amazing. The thing I appreciate about Paul is that Paul, we know he was a Jew of Jews. He talks about that in his letters, okay? He talks about that in his letters a lot. But he also was a Greek scholar as well. I mean, he, he really understood how to relate to the Gentiles. And what's amazing here is this word reconcile that you see. You know, I wish I had a pointer. There it is. This word reconcile, reconciling, reconciled, reconciliation, reconciling, reconciliation again. Okay, reconcile to God. He's making this point. That word in the Greek is katalage. Katalage simply means this, okay? Simply means this, is that God knew firsthand, it has two separate distinct definitions to it that I've studied in the past, is that God knew that we would be rebellious. He knew it. He knew it. And then the second point is, is that he would use his son Jesus to reconcile our hard hearts. That he would use Jesus as the, she- the, the lamb that be slain on behalf of us. And so God knew that when he says reconciliation, they, oh, wait a minute. He gave us a minute. Okay, so Paul, you're saying that. Okay, I understand. We're, we're pretty hard-hearted people. I get it. I get it. That word hit him, and he uses it like five or six times in this passage. God was reconciling himself through Christ. Gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Wait a minute. If you're a new creation, the old things have passed away. For the Corinthian church, for them, it wasn't the old covenant. It wasn't them struggling with the law of the old covenant that they were wrestling with in Hebrews. For the Corinthian church, it was more like what I described about my personal life. It was them wanting to go back into the world and be reckoned and, and, and reunite with the world. It was Corinthianized, the, 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 the term for that, Corinthianized means sexual immorality. It was a th- thousand sacred prostitutes in the name of religion in this city. So this was a very worldly city, okay? And Paul is trying to help them understand, look, you're a new creation now. The old has come, the new, the old things have passed away. And look, new things have come. That's a totally different meeting to them. That's a totally different meeting to them. And so I think when he says this, everything is from God who reconciled us through Christ, gave us this ministry of reconciliation. He's like, look, honor Jesus with what you've been given. You've got this ministry of reconciliation. Now that Jesus is gone and he's ascended to heaven, he now wants to work through us. He wants you to be the vessel. He wants you to be the ambassador. It's interesting, when you, when, I'm from New York City, right? And so in New York City, you go to the UN, nobody can find parking, right? Nobody can find parking, okay? Basically, it'll cost you 50 bucks. We were up there, we went to the 911 Memorial almost two years ago. And we couldn't get nowhere near there, and it cost us $50 to park. I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this is wrong. I mean, this is just, it's wrong. I mean, it's just something wrong with charging 50 bucks to put a car on, on a piece of cement. But what's really interesting about this is, is, is that, you know, when you go to the UN and, and you see all the parking spaces for the diplomats and the ambassadors, and these guys got car blonde parking, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty amazing. You know, that's pretty special. That's who we are before Christ. We're special. We're special people. We're ambassadors. Certain that God is making this appeal through us. We plead you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him with no sin to be sin for us so we might become the righteousness of God. Brothers and sisters, I'm really grateful for you. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Let's remember Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Let's remember how powerful his blood is. Let's remember his prayer life and imitate that. And let's remember that we are ambassadors for Christ. There's a few things, few additional scriptures for further study that I'll leave up here that will help us reconcile the old covenant and the new covenant. We didn't have time to get into that. But let's remember Jesus, the mediator. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you, God, that you've stepped in for us, that you are the mediator of a new covenant, that you sent your son to die for us, to reconcile us, God, using his blood shed on the cross, a lamb who was slain, this innocent human being that's given us a chance to walk in the light. 
Father, thank you so much for his prayer life. I pray that we can imitate that prayer life. I pray, God, that we will imitate who Jesus is. And God, thank you for the ministry of reconciliation. Thank you, God, that you've given us an opportunity to be an ambassador to represent you on this earth as we get to spend time with you here. But more importantly, we look forward to the time to come. Thank you for the broken body of Jesus and his blood. It's in his name we pray. Amen.